Far Out show that I think really makes some great connections between ancient aliens and ancient history, the races and blood types, the elite and the bloodlines, the inner earth and abductions, reptilian beings and a century-long manipulation of humanity, and a thousand other threads on the conspiracy sweater. No one's freezing out in the cold tonight. I don't know what more you'd want from a THC. <laughs> but we all know humanity has a rich history of experiences with a wide variety of strange humanoids, including Bigfoot, the Greys, reptilians, gnomes, fairies, and many other things. While still mysterious, the popular motif is that Bigfoot lives in the woods, the Greys are from Zeta Reticuli, and the rest may be some type of multidimensional beings. But maybe all these things are a lot more connected than previously thought. And there's a strong case to be made that the places they call home reside right beneath our feet. Well, today's guest, William Michael Mott, is one of the leading voices that has been taking that position in his book, Caverns, Cauldrons, and Concealed Creatures. Now in its third edition, it's considered by many to be some of the most comprehensive and entertaining work on this subject, and I couldn't agree more. I'm psyched to have him here. Mike Mott, my man, welcome to THC. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate it, man. I really appreciate the invitation. Yeah, this is going to be awesome. I love the idea that other types of intelligent humanoid beings live inside the Earth. And it's quickly becoming one of my favorite topics. And I think you make some great points that the larger UFO, cryptid, paranormal community has missed. But to start us off, a lot of this involves going back and looking at old myths and legends from different parts of the world. Areas we're told had no communication in those days. And we find these commonalities in their stories that are really so similar in some cases, it's hard to believe that they would spawn independently in different parts of the world if they weren't based on some real experiences. Would you say that's one of the prevailing thoughts that kind of links up a lot of these arguments you make in the book? Well, sure. I mean, if you think about it, uh, throughout history, the, the, we've, we've always believed, and I mean, we collectively as human beings all over the planet, we've believed in, in not just a spiritual other world, but in physical other worlds that physically exist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they called them fairy lands or whatever in, in, in Northern Europe and, and by different names ar around the globe. But the general idea is that there are others who, who live there and who occasionally come into our area, take what they need, and then they leave. They come and they, they take genetic material a lot of times, whether it's from people or animals or crops, and they seemingly vanish without a trace. And this is something that goes all the way back into antiquity, and we see this even today with the UFO phenomenon. You know, We have this whole idea that UFOs come from far away and because we're told that. We've been conditioned to believe that these are extraterrestrial beings, which really works to the advantage of any any race or species, you know, group of species that that is living here with us. If they're taking advantage of us in our world, in our realm, I guess you could say, but they don't want us to put a stop to it, then it's it's totally within their their interest to have us, you know, look at the stars and say, oh, well, they come, they come from up there. We can't stop them. You know, we can't interfere with what they're doing. Oh, right. because, you know, again and again, you'll find this in UFO encounters, you'll find this whole theme of, oh, yeah, we come from up there. We come from this star system and that star system. And it, it's such an obvious, to me anyway, misdirection where they're saying, we come from far, far away. Uh, look up there. Look up there. But, you know, don't look under your oceans. Don't look under those mountains over there. <laughs> you know, don't look deep in that in that wilderness area. Just look up there because that's where we really come from. And, you know, this is something that goes all the way back into antiquity, like you were saying, because with Zeus, for instance, you know, Zeus would come down and, and he would purloin what he wanted from the mortal women and, and so forth. And, of course, that was always about genetics, really, if you look at those stories. And then he would go back to his faraway place, Mount Olympus, which was supposedly so high that no human being could, could ever reach Olympus. So it was always, look at, look at us. We're way up there. We're out of your reach. You, you can't possibly do anything about it. And so I think that this is a, a theme that we see constantly and consistently updated throughout the history of anomalous encounters. Yeah, I agree. And uh, in terms of the UFO story, I had never really thought about that before, but you make a great point that why should we trust these entities outright, especially if they're doing strange experiments on us? Uh, a lot well, of times sure. people say they're very painful. Right. And I, I guess the argument could be that there's no risk in telling us where they're from if we can't reach there with our technology, but or, still. Or if we believe that, if we believe that we can't. Right, right. And, and look, it's like this. Okay, I'm going to go on a couple of points here, and this is talking about – First, let me say that, you know, think of the Earth as a huge living thing and a, and a huge biosphere. We're finding now extreme, what are called extremophile organisms living in all sorts of hostile environments, including far beneath the Earth. 
if there are other civilizations that have reached a high level of, de of development, which I believe that there were in the past, which were destroyed or had to, had to retreat, whether it was from conditions on the surface becoming less conducive to their health or war or whatever it might have been, then obviously the place to go would be underground and under the oceans. And more UFOs are seen coming and going from volcanoes, mountaintops, mountainsides, and more than any are seen coming from large bodies of water, including our oceans, coming and going, or seen over large bodies of water. Mm -hmm. So that being said, if these beings are so advanced that they can travel across the galaxy, they can warp space and time or create a wormhole or exceed the speed of light or whatever it is they supposedly can do to, to come way out here to the edge of the galaxy in the boondocks where we live. If they're really that advanced, then if there's something wrong with their genetics or whatever the current theme is, because actually that's the theme that goes all the way back, is that they're, these beings have always wanted our genetics. Right. But if there's some sort of emergency and they can't, they've, they're coming here to get genetics – if they're so advanced that they can warp space and time and create wormholes or whatever they do to, to do what they do, they will be able to repair their genetics. They can rewrite their genetic code. They can repair any errors in their code because we're reaching the point now where we can almost do that. Yeah. Okay? So an, another thing to think about here is if these beings are so advanced, why don't they just come and get what they need and never even wake anybody up? <laughs> Why don't they just come in, you know, put down a dampening EM field, something that suppresses – well, I think that's what they do anyway, but something that really suppresses, you know, your awareness, makes you stay asleep, take what they need painlessly, and leave mm -hmm. if they're really advanced. But no, they come in, they make a big spectacle, there's a little sadomasochism involved, a little uh, dominance going on here with these things. It's, it's sort of this whole Pavlovian conditioning, it's, it seems to me to be designed to – create a Stockholm Syndrome sort of reaction in the people that they repeatedly victimize. They come in and they create painful, painful, and terrifying encounters with people, and then they basically say, oh, you're special, you're chosen, you know, we're just here to help you, we created you, blah, blah, blah. But really, if they were that advanced, why would they have to do that? Supposedly, they're, they're telepathic. Well, if they're telepathic, then why don't they know about all the terror and anger and anguish that they cause these people? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why do they keep doing it? Okay. So my point is that these beings are somehow related to us genetically, or else they would not be able to interact with us in the way that they do. They are probably part of the biodiversity of the Earth, to some extent anyway, and by that I'm, talk I'm touching on the subject of the Nephilim here. But they are part of the, the biodiversity here. They're very interested in genetics of both people and animals. And, you know, if they were from far away, like I said, first of all, they'd be able to fix their own genetic problems, and second of all, they wouldn't be so fascinated with ours. I agree, and you've also stated in the book a lot of these things seem super foreign, but they're not. They're really all just humanoid forms uh, with slight variations. Right. And if it was something from the other side of the galaxy, you'd think we'd be seeing some like giant amoeba or some kind of like really radically different thing, and that's not the case. Right, or we might not even recognize it. And I'm not saying that there aren't other humanoid forms in the galaxy. Right. I have no doubt that there probably are, but these guys – Occam's, Occam's razor is a, is a very simple principle, which is the simplest answer is usually the correct one. So if you, if you go back through the history of thousands and thousands of years, you'll find that these beings have always been here. You know, they don't say they came from far away on other planets. I know that what Sitchin said about Nibiru, Nibiru and, and so forth, and I know, you know, about the watchers and the, the, the 200 watchers being stationed on the moon, just like the Yagigi and, and all the rest of it. But – all this stuff is still centralized to the general area of the earth. Mm -hmm. It's all – the focus is on the genetic biodiversity of the earth, the garden, okay? So it, like you were saying from my book, no matter how outrageous these forms seem initially to people who are having these experiences or these encounters, if you take a, an objective look at what they're seeing, even though they're, they're initially shocked – there's nothing that they're seeing that does not conform to an earthly vertebrate template. Two arms, two legs, central trunk, one head, two eyes. You know, in fact, if you go back uh, into the earlier part of the 20th century, there were more strange forms seen then, more bizarre UFO dots, for instance, than there are now mm -hmm. by far. Okay, the, the range was a little, a little more strange. Again, though, they all still had the same uh, characteristics of genetic, a genetic life here. You know, if you were from somewhere 
in a very re remote area. And someone said, hey, I want to show you something. They took you in a warehouse, and they showed you an elephant, a giraffe, a Maasai warrior, a penguin, a hermit crab, and an octopus. <laughs> and you'd never seen any of these things before, and you had no idea what they were. You would think, where in the world did those come from? Mm, yep. What What is that? You know, you, you would have a hard time believing they all came from the same planet is what I'm saying. But they do. They all they all have a common genetic heritage because they're all part of the biosphere here. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with these beings. They there's no reason whatsoever to believe that they come from somewhere else. And this situation is much bigger than just the sector of, you know, aliens. But right. another great point about the alien idea is that if you go back and you look at like the big wave of UFOs in the 50s, 40s and 50s, it seems like the technology that the crafts are using has only really, it seems to go parallel with us. You know, that's why a lot of people now are saying they think they were secret government crafts, but maybe there's some other type of being that has a parallel technology that may be 50 years ahead of ours, but it's not so radical that it seems like it came from Zeta Reticuli. Right. Well, if you look if you look at it historically, you'll find, for instance, in the Middle Ages, in the Dark Ages, they were encountering these same beings. Except at that time, they called them sylphs, fairies, things that things like this. And these beings at that time had technology, but it was called magical, you know, magical technology, items, whatever. Charlemagne declared war on what he called the princes of the air. Okay, or the kingdom of the air, because these supposedly wooden ships were coming by sky, by, from in the air, and they were raiding farms and stealing not just livestock, but young women. And Charlemagne became so angry that he gathered together his armies and, and marched them out onto the plain and, and screamed at the sky for a while, and of course they never came down to fight. Then you go forward a few hundred years or several hundred years, and you have uh, – you know, other updates to, the, to this thing where, where, for instance, a ship was seen that supposedly threw an anchor and it got stuck on the steeple of a, of a church. Wow. It, it's as if their technology has always been just a shade ahead of where we currently are. Right. Uh, or at least in appearance, in the way they, they, in the way they present themselves. Obviously, if you've got a, something that looks like a wooden ship but it's flying, that's actually some sort of advanced technology. But they don't have a lot of imagination. Okay, they basically try to stay right ahead of the popular concepts in, the, in our popular culture, whatever our, our current popular culture is at the time. Um, during the 1800s, we had the you know the the, the, the mystery airship flap. Well, at that time, there were no uh, zeppelins flying around at all, and the hot air balloon was not widely known or was barely getting started. But here were these airships flying around you know the, the southwest of the United States, and you know you have to ask. Are they keeping up with our popular culture or, or our, our subconscious in some way? Mm -hmm. Because, again, you move forward from that point and you come to the beginning of the UFO age as we know it now, where you know Kenneth Arnold sees the, the, the disks over Mount Rainier. And before that happened, uh, there was another guy named Richard Shaver yes. who had written about these subterranean ancients who lived inside the earth. And, you know, a lot of people consider Shaver a crackpot. In some ways, he might have been, but he still seems to have known something because there are so many things he wrote about which are still very much in ufology today and in witness accounts today. And everything from abduction, uh, subterranean bases, silver disc shaped craft, which he said were kept in the caves, interest in human genetics. All this stuff, and that was before Arnold had his sighting. Arnold had his sighting of silvery craft. Or they might have been – they weren't exactly disc-shaped, but somehow out of that, he, he described them as skipping like saucers. So flying saucers stuck. Well, as soon as he said that, what do we start seeing? We start seeing saucer shapes. Mm -hmm. So they, they appear to update their presentation to us to match whatever our current expectation is. And if we're reading science fiction – since the pulp age of science fiction, and we're expecting aliens from outer space, well, then how are they going to present themselves? They're going to put on that mask, and they're going to come and say, yeah, that's who we are. Right. Why not? If the misdirection is already laid out for you, why not just step into that role and make it easy on yourself? Exactly. And I know the Richard Shaver saga is pretty popular. We've always kind of glossed over it. Like, it's come up a time or two, but uh, we hadn't really looked at it in any serious depth. But 
tell us a little bit more about the details of, of what he was talking about. He was talking about two underground races that were kind of at war with each other, right? Yeah, he basically was talking about um, what he believed was a hard materialistic reality. He was pretty much an atheist. He, you know, had a lot of issues, and, and he even spent some time, you know, in an asylum for a few months. Hmm. But, you know, how many times do you hear about people who've had these types of experiences having a breakdown, right. that type of thing? He basically was a guy who was working with a welding gun, and back during that time, the welding guns were highly dangerous. They, they, had, they produced a, a really powerful electromagnetic field. And while he was welding, he started hearing, when he would run the welding gun, he would start hearing voices. And the voices did not appear to be aware of him. They were just talking, like, you know, talking about the people above them making noise and all this kind of stuff and all, all the terrible things they were doing to people and how hilarious it was and, and so forth, which, of course, ties right in with, you know, demonology and, mm -hmm. and things of this nature. But Shaver basically at first thought he was losing it, and then he started seeing evidence that, that there was something going on because what they would say would correspond to something that he would see happen. And so at some point, he claimed that they basically came after him, and he ended up being taken to the caves because I guess that he had figured out something or they realized he was listening in or, or whatever. But Shaver claimed that – and he did this first through a science fiction story, which he sent as a true account to Amazing Stories. And Ray Palmer, the editor of Amazing Stories, found the account where an editor had thrown it in the trash can. He pulled it out of the trash, saw the letter that Shaver had written, and said, man, this is great stuff. So he contacted him. He said, can I use this? He said, sure. He said, well, I'm going to add some stuff to it. So Palmer then embellished it with all kinds of sci-fi trappings and, and so forth. But basically, it was Shaver's account of what he had been told had happened before the flood or the, the great cataclysm. He claimed, you know, that there were two races on Earth that were like basically correspondent to uh, the, the Nephilim. They were they were giant peoples. They were hybrid peoples, sometimes mixed with animals genetically. This type of thing, and they this has been done through advanced elder science. And something happened, something cataclysmic. The sun changed its solar radiation, or was going to. And they figured out that the surface of the earth would become inhospitable to them. So the, the elite of these groups left the planet and went elsewhere in our solar system, most likely. At that point, those who were left behind went underground to avoid the rays of a now poisonous sun. Hmm. It's interesting if you look at it, you'll, you'll find that in the, uh, first, in, the, in the Sumerian king list – and in the uh, in the in the books in in the, in the in the patriarch accounts, uh, the list of patriarchs in the Old Testament, both you'll see that each successive generation after the flood, the lifespan got shorter and shorter and shorter. And I mean, it went from hundreds of years successively down to scores of years. Mm -hmm. Okay, as if something had changed. You'll find again, you know, in the apocryphal books, it will talk about how many of these sons of the fallen were locked beneath the earth. And, and it, it says it's like a punishment, and their fathers are locked there permanently as a punishment or until the day of judgment. You know, as the book of Jude, which quotes in the book of Enoch, says, you know, angels who kept not their first estate, but were reserved in chains of darkness until the judgment of the great day. So, you know, the, the concept is there that these beings fled beneath the surface or forced beneath the surface. But again, this is a theme that you see all the way up to the present day, you know, whether you're dealing with anomalous humanoids um, of any, of just about any type. Okay. Uh, for instance, Bigfoot, there's an association with low lying areas more. It's just as much as there are mountainous areas, but there are usually caves, sumps, sinkholes, grottos, um, you know, these types of things nearby. Mm -hmm. wherever you see these, these types of beings. And not just Bigfoot. El, El Chupacabra, the same way, uh, in the El Yunque uh, rainforest in, in um, Puerto Rico, there are gigantic, extensive cave systems that have never been explored right there where they've been seeing this thing. So, you know, if, if there are beings here that, that essentially have a subterranean environment that they, that they, that they mainly dwell in, they'll, they, they, would, they would come out, you know, primarily to, to partake 
uh, of, of what our environment has to offer, and then they will return to where they, where they came from. And you see that a lot of times with the sudden disappearance of anomalous humanoids and anomalous creatures. They'll be on hot on the track of these things, and then boom, they're just gone. Um, and, of course, all of these things have been seen in conjunction with tunnels, mines, caves, you know, the, the list goes on and on. It, it just makes sense. E even if you're talking about lake monsters, there, there are often uh, associations with underwater cavern systems. So, Yeah, I do. I love the possibility of different creatures and humanoid races living in the inner Earth. But one of the things that my logical brain can't get over is why they would... Just why these seemingly more advanced beings would just surrender the surface to us. You know, the beaches, the mountains, the sunrise and sunset. There's a lot of amazing things to enjoy on the surface. It seems weird that they'd be okay with just staying below ground, unless, of course, they had to. Well, unless they had to. If you, if you look at what they do, they, they tend to come out mainly by night or, by, or at dusk, just like the fairy folk of old, you know, or, or trolls or whatever who fear the sun. So basically what they're doing is – they avoid sunlight as much as they can, even with the so-called grays and other types of, uh, of so-called extraterrestrials that have been seen. They usually have or often have these, these dark eyes, these huge dark eyes. Okay, if you have huge eyes, those are not the eyes of a space-faring species mm -hmm. because space is the most hostile environment imaginable for the eye. Okay. The radiation is, is so intense that any creature which evolved or was, was even designed to live in deep space or travel throughout space a great bit would have smaller eyes. Okay? Mm -hmm. These beings have enormous eyes, and nocturnal creatures are the creatures that have enormous eyes. Creatures that dwell in the dark for a, to a large extent are creatures that have enormous eyes. And of course, there are those who claim that they have seen these beings take off the black covering, and it's basically basically like a giant contact lens. And there's an enormous reptilian or, or humanoid eye beneath the covering. So again, these are all indicators that these beings are subterranean. When you look uh, at accounts, for instance, of the greys themselves and how they move, they're described as having sort of a sideways shuffling gait. You know, they, they don't take big strides and, and so forth. And they kind of they kind of mill around almost like ants, okay? And if you were a, a, a species that moved, you know, in, in narrow ways beneath the earth, that's the way you would that's the way you would move. And that's probably the body and the head configuration that you would have. Yeah, I think that makes sense to me. And we were talking about how the stories of these kind of beings, they span multiple cultures, multiple time periods. Let's step back a little bit and highlight some of these these similarities amongst the stories. Tell us about a couple of the legends we hear from the East that kind of fit this mold. Well, you know, in Japan, for instance, you have a, a story about a, a fisherman who is taken beneath the sea. And he is taken by the, the king under the sea, and he is taken down there to, to marry the king's daughter, to create a hybrid offspring. And, of course, the king is portrayed as a dragon, hmm. okay, a reptilian. Um, if you go to China, you find the same thing. You find the dragon kings who live under the earth, and they, too, are interested in human genetics, and they come and, and they take people for purposes of procreation. If you go to the Indian subcontinent and to the, the Himalayas, You'll find the legend of the Naga, the Naga folk, the Naga people, who are reptilian humanoids. They, they are described as uh, looking like snakes or serpents, but they have a human body. And it's interesting because they, too, are obsessed with kidnapping humans, not just for procreation and, and sexual pleasure and so forth, but for s sadistic purposes, which, of course, ties in with UFO encounters and, and what they do to people, and also as, as a food resource. So this is this is in all those legends too, and you want you know speaking of the Naga in the Old Testament in the Bible, we're told in the very beginning there's a reptilian humanoid that shows up. He's walking on two legs. He comes into the garden, and what does he do? He attempts to seduce the woman. And in Hebrew, the word for the serpent in the garden is Nahash, okay, which is very very close to Naga. It is. You could actually spell it N A G H A S H or N A H A S H. You come to the New World and you have the Nahuatl, which again is a serpent-type being. This, this is a theme that you find all over the, 
all over the world, that these subterranean beings are older, that there's something reptilian about some of them, not all of them, but, but some of them, as if they're, they're somehow tied in with older species on the planet, and that they're very, very fascinated, with, in fact, dependent upon procreation with the human race. And even in folk and fairy lore of Europe, you'll find the same thing. You have the frog prince, um, this whole idea in very um, watered-down form of a sort of a reptilian slash amphibian uh, humanoid who seduces a woman and says, hey, you know, I may be hideous to you, but I'm really a wealthy and powerful prince. And if you will just mate with me, I will give you everything that you want. I will fulfill all your wishes. And so this is a theme. And, and of course, that, that keep in mind that, that that frog prince comes out of a deep well. Mm-hmm. He's found in a well. So, uh, again, you know, this is a theme that, that is universal. It, it even exists in Native American folklore. Right. Yeah. The Native Americans, they have uh, quite a few different tribes have really awesome stories. But I think the one that struck me as the most interesting in your book was the Choctaw Indians. I think they have some pretty rich lore about their local mound area, right? Yeah, they, they do. There's, there's a mound uh, – there's a mound that's open to the public, and they advertise that as the the Nanawaya Mound or Cave Mound, but it's not. There's another one that, in just in the last decade or so, has been locked away f- uh, from people. You know, you're really not supposed to go in there and see it. It's it's back in the swamp, in some woods, and it's a natural formation, or so they say. It's just this huge outcrop of of stone and and, and earth, um, just jutting up out of the swampland. And there are caves in the front, little caves in the front that you can see, but there's actually a bigger entrance around back that has been cemented shut. It's underneath uh, some sort of uh, deck work that they put up to cover it up, I guess. But they had the, they sealed that shut, and, and the legend, not the legend, the rumor is that that some people went down in there and never came back, which is kind of interesting because it's not that big of a mound. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they to go down there and not come back, you know, that there must be some tunnels in there but they claim that in some of their legends they say they came out of that mound themselves in yeah. other legends they say that there are all kinds of creatures that, that come out of that mound from the underworld uh shampi which is their version of bigfoot um, and also uh bopoli which are like little rock throwers little hairy men that live in the woods and throw rocks all these types of creatures a whole range of creatures that supposedly live in and around that area, but actually throughout this whole area where I live, because I'm, I'm in Mississippi too. But that that's basically, you know, a serious part of their lore. In fact, one of the times when I made a trip to that actual cave mound, uh, there was one time I went there with some other people, and as we neared the mound, we started hearing drums, and there wasn't supposed to be anybody there, and 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 we stood there for a few minutes listening. And then I see a what looked like a naked guy run across the top of the mound, and he never came down. And we walked around, and we went up the mound. There was nobody there. Now I'm thinking maybe we, we interrupted somebody's vision quest, okay? <laughs> maybe somebody was there doing something personal, and we interrupted it. But another time, okay, this is a sacred site to the Choctaw. And once an entire busload of Native Americans from Oklahoma – had come all the way to this mound on sort of a pilgrimage. And I happened to be there at the time. And I was up there taking some pictures and with, my, with some of my kids and stuff. And uh, this bus pulls up. And all these people start getting out. And, you know, they're regular middle-class folks and, and so forth. And they go running over to the mound. And some of them are bending down real low and looking in the, the little caves, little caves you can crawl into if you are, are feeling real brave, which I wouldn't recommend. Right. And... This one lady stands back. She's very, very uh, – she, she's like a school teacher or something, you know, or a nurse. I mean, a very professional-looking lady with glasses, and she's standing back. And, I mean, she stood back like, you know, 60 yards. And I was talking to her and everything, and she was telling me about how they came there and why and so forth. And I looked over where these other people were, and I said, aren't you going to go and at least, you know, look down, look inside that little cave? And she said, she said, I'm not going anywhere near those those caves. And I said, Why? And she said, because Bigfoot lives in there. <laughs> that was it. And that was it. And I, and I looked at her and I said, really? And she said, I'm serious. She said, there's no way I'm going near those holes. So this is a very deep belief for them that, that there's something uh, otherworldly about that site. But there are other places like that all over North America where Native Americans believe that either they came out of the earth or there are other things that, that dwell in the earth that are, are better left alone. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I I just love that story about the Choctaw because you have the this area, this big public display where they're drawing attention, and then you have this little secret area that uh, yeah. no one really is talking about. It's classic misdirection. And- well, you know, and, and that's their business. You know, I, the way I look at it is that's a sacred site to them. I you know I consider myself lucky to have gotten to go see it a few times. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't want somebody tramping all if it were my sacred site. I wouldn't want somebody trampling around all over it either. That's true. Um, it's it's sort of a pet peeve of mine anyway, because I'll see on on different articles and on television and so forth where that somebody where they'll come in and they'll dig up this huge site and they'll dig up all these people and they'll take them away. You know, and I'm sitting here thinking, how would you feel if somebody went to the graveyard where your grandparents were buried and they did that? <laughs> right, that is true. Uh, and you mentioned, of course, we see similarities to the legends and the myths of Europe and the fact that. As we talked about, one of the themes is a lot of times the involvement has to do with royalty and genetic manipulation and bloodlines. And so when we get into these stories coming out of Great Britain and Ireland, that is super interesting to me. Because, of course, it's a big umbrella, but I consider this a conspiracy show. Right. And this is kind of where these two things cross over a little bit almost. Well, they do, and it's interesting to me. I had never heard of David Icke, for instance, when I wrote the first edition of this book. And then he quoted extensively from the first edition in one of his books. I th- I'm not sure which one it was. It might have been Children of the Matrix. It was, it was in one of his books. He quoted quite extensively from it. I'm not a believer in most of what he promulgates, mm-hmm. but he does come up with some interesting connections and some interesting research. And – some of the stuff he comes up with seems to be legit. Now, I don't believe that people are shape-shifting humanoids. I don't think that that's what's going on with these royals or any of this type of stuff. What he may be describing may be a form of demonic possession. All right. Okay. Something electromagnetic going on. Um, I remember back during uh, the 2000 election, there were people all over the place who said that they saw Al Gore – do something really strange when he was on television where he was in a live interview. He was very angry about the election results, that which were still not decided. And he was being very, very belligerent. And a whole bunch of people, credible people, said that when he did this, that his skin tone started flickering and everybody else around him stayed, stayed normal. He started changing his sort of color and started like going from green and red. And then his eyes started looking really strange, like bulging in black. Uh-huh. And then it went away. And – when this happened, it was all over the internet. Well, now it's not. It's gone. I basically, at that time, I said, well, that's interesting. I'm going to see if I can find that video. It, was, it had been on YouTube and stuff. It was gone. So I contacted somebody at CNBC because I figured, well, if anybody's you know, nonpartisan, it's CNBC. <laughs> so I contacted them, not CNBC, uh, excuse me, C-SPAN. Definitely not CNBC. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah, C-SPAN. And so I, I contacted C-SPAN because they are highly nonpartisan. And I was talking to a guy. He said, oh, yeah. He said, I, he said, I remember seeing that. He said, I thought that was really weird. And I said, that was really strange. He said, I couldn't figure that out. And he, and he said, I'll see if I can get the video for you. So I waited and I waited. And I sent him a message. Well, I'm still looking for it. I sent him a message. He sends me back a message. I'm still looking for it. Finally, he, he sends me an email. He says, look. He says, he says, I literally cannot find that video clip anywhere. He said, it has been totally removed from every archive source that we had. He said, it's gone. Wow. See, when you hear things like that, you have to say, you know, what is the deal here? Is there a conspiracy about this type of stuff? Now, do I believe that Gore is a reptilian shapeshifter? No, I don't. (laughs) I think that what you're seeing is a disturbance in the electromagnetic field that was somehow localized to him and that the cameras were picking it up, what the human eye couldn't see. That could very well be. I, I have a hard time. A lot of those videos are up on YouTube, and because of Photoshop and editing, I have such a hard time right. drawing any kind of conclusion from them. But you can't deny that a theme amongst these myths is preservation of bloodlines and life extension and some type of genetic manipulation. And that's also the theme of the history of our planet's elite, as far as I can tell. It is, and you know the the underworld itself. These these hidden races that live under the ground are associated with forbidden and hidden knowledge, which they keep for themselves. Um, longevity, immortality, you know, all these things. And so there seems to be a connection. When you look at, for instance, uh, the Arthurian legends and, and the legend of the Lady in the Lake. Well, the Lady in the Lake lives in a cave under the lake. Okay, and she's very very concerned with making sure that Ar- that Arthur gets to be king. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
then again, you look at legends like Rumpelstiltskin, and here we have this little, basically a troll or a, or a goblin who lives under the ground, and he's, he's very, very interested, again, in obtaining the child from the princess. Mm -hmm. He wants that child, which is royal, a royal bloodline. So, yeah, this is a theme that you find throughout history, and you don't just find it in Europe. You find it in, in the Far East, too. So mm -hmm. it's just a, it's something that you find. You know, it, it, it leads back to this whole idea of those who, who believe that they have a divine right to rule, but their divine right in spite of what people who are in the Merovingian heresies and stuff think, their, their belief of divine right is really not about being descended from Christ and Mary Magdalene. Their belief of divine right goes much, much further back, mm -hmm. you know, back into uh, the, the most distant mist of antiquity, all the way back to ancient Sumer, okay, to the Sumerians. Yeah. And it always has to do with non-human beings who basically set up their offspring, their hybrid offspring, to rule. And uh, this is a theme that, that, that has come all the way down to us today, and, and that's what David Icke is kind of kind of continuing with the, with the stuff he talks about. A lot of dots, I think, connect here, because a uh, major conspiratorial theme is that the elite are communicating with something non-human. And the two main ways people talk about is either they're taking orders from some alien race, or they're using occult magic rituals to communicate with some spiritual entity. And I think you could also say a third possibility is that there are beings that exist here on the Earth that have probably had an evolution that lasts longer than ours, or maybe they su survived the last cataclysm, so they have more information about this planet than we do. Right. And all you have to have is a few contacts in, in special places. The Vatican, secret societies, you have a few contacts, right. you know, the, the British royals, and by only communicating with less than 100 humans, you could pretty much control the surface like a chessboard. Well, sure, and if you look at it, I mean... All these things could still be interconnected to some in some way. I mean, these these very ancient races that would set up their puppets to control human governments, they could also have bloodlines that go millions of years back. Right. Okay. Whether they're hominids or reptilians or whatever. And when I say reptilian, understand that that so-called dinosaurs were warm-blooded creatures. Mm -hmm. They were endothermic. Some of them have feathers so fine, so excuse me, so fine that they were basically hair. Okay, so over millions of years, they would probably look just as much like uh, mammals as mammals do. Okay, that's true. Sure. So this whole idea of the seed of the serpent, it, it's a prevalent theme around the world, and it, it's part of a lot of secret society stuff too. And if you go look, for instance, in, in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter two. Daniel says, when he's talking to Nebuchadnezzar about uh, human history based on Nebuchadnezzar's dream of this, this statue of different, different materials, and he basically says the last age of the earth or human history, there's going to be a final empire. And the statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw had feet that were made of iron mixed with what the King James Version calls miry clay or, or crumbly clay. Hmm. And Daniel says, He's, he's interpreting the dream, and the different areas of the statue of different metals correspond to a different empire. And the feet, he says, are the last age. And he says, for as you saw iron mixed with miry clay, so shall they seek to mingle themselves with the seed of men, but it will not hold. Mm. So again, here's this theme that even until the very end of time, that these beings are always going to be trying to genetically mix with Homo sapiens. And it will not hold. And it will not hold. And if it does not hold, that would explain why they have to keep coming back, keep coming back, keep coming back. Right. Yeah. That's fascinating. And another thing from your book that I love in this whole thread of these uh, beings maybe being in the shadows and being the real puppet masters, right. there's a lot, there's a pattern of world leaders and generals getting strange visitations that you could argue are forms of this manipulation too, right? Right, right. I mean, Napoleon had a visitor they called the Dark Man. You know, he would just show up in his chambers, and, and uh, he was even seen by, you know, by his generals, and uh, they thought he was the devil. And he would come, and he would be seen leaving secret conferences when no one went in, things of this nature. Hitler also had a guy like this. They called him the Tibetan. Yeah. Uh, and this strange character would show up and then depart or just vanish. 
And it's interesting because Hitler himself said, you know, one of his main rationales was he wanted to create a so-called master race, but he was basing this on a race that he claimed that he had had contact with. And the message that he said that he basically got was, we have to make ourselves like them or they will destroy us when they take over the earth, basically. He said, I have seen the new man. He is intrepid and cruel. I was afraid of him. Wow. So this type of manipulation of world leaders seems to be par for the course for these beings. And, you know, in biblical terms, they would have called these beings principalities and powers, you know, um, some sort of being that that may be uh, something that is beyond what we can understand is physically real, even though it can be physically real, but it manipulates um, our civilization. Yeah, and now people have plenty of stories of seeing a Nordic race of aliens that have blonde hair and blue eyes. Right. And I don't know, you just say Napoleon sees a guy and Hitler sees a guy. I mean, just right there, by changing the way those two people think and maybe altering their actions, I mean, that's a huge change in human history, just appear making those two appearances. Well, sure. I mean, this is a theme that goes, again, all the way back. I mean, Alexander the Great, you know, he believed he was the son of, of one of the gods. And he went to an oracle in the Libyan desert when he was in North Africa with his army. And they told him, you know, yeah, you definitely are. Yeah, you're one of them, you know. And, and uh, so he had this whole idea that, that therefore, he was, he was entitled to conquer the earth. Okay. And he had a lot of strange things which were chronicled, you know, during his, his advance across Asia Minor and into India. Um, he, was, he laid siege to one city, and he could not get through the wall. And a flying shield was said to have shown up and shattered the wall with a lightning bolt. And then again, when he was crossing a river or about to cross a river in India, he was opposed by so-called flying shields, silvery shields that came out of the river and attacked his army. So, of course, to him, these are gods because it's in their interest for him to believe they are gods because then he will do whatever they say. He will believe he has divine right to rule, all this type of stuff, in the same way that today it's in their interest for us to believe they're aliens from somewhere far, far away. Yeah, man, I am loving this theme. And I think even Constantine claimed to have some big vision in the sky that made him convert the whole Roman Empire to a Christian nation. Now that is some serious influence. And the cliff note of that visitation is either accepted by people who want to believe the religious narrative or it's just dismissed. But there is a third option that some dark, ancient, underground power center looking to increase influence on the surface use divine intervention as a way to pull Rome's puppet strings. Well, sure. I mean, even now we have something called Project Bluebeam which supposedly we haven't used, but I don't believe that for a minute. I think we probably use it all the time. And it's used to create these types of hallucinations or images or I want to say hallucinations, holograph, holographs probably would be a better word, holograms in the, in the sky, holographic images. You know, they use these things to manipulate po whole populations. You know, if you were to uh, create an image, well, even recently they supposedly had an image of a flying horse over Mecca, <laughs> which ties right in with something from – Muslim eschatology about the end times that you would see this flying horse, which is the Barak, which is what it's actually called, of uh, uh, that Muhammad flew on in one night from uh, from Mecca and Medina to to uh, Jerusalem and back. Interesting so, name too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, yeah, very interesting. It's it's a thing that we have to ask: Are we doing that? Is somebody else doing that? Uh, who, who's causing these types of, of, of manipulations? And Richard Shaver said, you know, that the, the subterrestrials, I mean, way back in the early 20th century, before, again, before the first major UFO sighting by Kenneth Arnold, Shaver was saying, you know, that these beings could create realistic looking, even solid appearing holograms in our skies and our oceans that would even show up on radar and then they would just disappear. Mm. Well, how many times has that been reported in UFO cases? Right, man. Maybe these underground races have been using Project Bluebeam longer than we've been alive. I had also read, uh, and I'm sure you already know this, but apparently Lewis and Clark and also Columbus wrote about these flying candles that would hover around them, which is a lot like the orbs people talk about seeing today. No, I actually haven't heard that about Lewis and Clark, but it wouldn't surprise me. I, I think that there was probably a, a high civilization here in North America at one point. And a lot of these anomalous events tie into that, and I think that these ancient beings that we're talking about are also a part of that. They, uh, you know, just just as anywhere else, they they're behind the scenes 
uh, manipulating uh, cultures and civilizations. I mean, even going back to the, the Hopi tale of the ant people and the snake people. I mean, you have the same theme of these subterranean beings. In that case, they were helping them survive. But, you know, it, it's just a, a theme that you see again and again that, that they are here. Mm-hmm. That's, that's just where they are. Yeah, another Indian tribe that had those type of stories. I can't remember the name of the tribe, but when they had met the Spanish explorers, they were talking about a being or something they would see called Mr. Bad Thing. I learned about this from your book. Can you tell the people about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, Senor Malacosa is what they called him. Well, that's what uh, Da Gama called him that. And Vasco Da Gama was, you know, an explorer who came through uh, southeastern United States and over into uh, over to the Texas region. And he claimed that he had met these, these Native Americans who, who said that this thing called Senor Malacosa was this being that came out of the ground and terrorized them. And the thing about this is that, again, this is it's a thing where the, these, these people have been conditioned. No, it wasn't Vasco de Gama. It was Cabeza de Vaca, excuse me. Uh, Cabeza de Vaca was exploring the, the region. And these Native Americans were being totally controlled by their fear of this being. So basically, they said that uh, that this thing would show up and he would dress as a male or a female, basically trying to seduce people. He would never eat if they offered him food, but he would tell them that he came from down inside the earth through a crevice that was nearby. He would take people apart and put them back together, which is, again, a theme that you find in ufology with the intrusive uh, surgeries and stuff. Mm-hmm. So, you know... I mean, this this is nothing new, and he was also about he was also accompanied by a bright light and an electrical sensation that would paralyze the victim. He had a wand which had a glowing end on it, which he would use as a weapon. You know, all these things are right out of ufology. Right. It's a weird thing because, like, just in the past two hundred years, I wonder if there's been major changes to the way these beings interact with us. Because when you look at old writings, it seems like they're just coming right up and talking to people whenever they choose to. They're flying around in the sky whenever they choose to. But it's almost like as our technology has advanced, as we've become more of a global society on the surface, they've even taken another further step back. At least that's what it seems to me. I mean, do you notice a difference in the way people talked about it today versus back then? Yeah, I think so. I think that they realize now that people are not going to believe they're gods. So they're not going to be able to control people in that way. So they have to now put on this guise, this disguise of being aliens yeah. because if they say they're aliens and they can come and say oh yeah well see we're, we, we've been monitoring your evolution and you're doing bad things and you, you need to do what we say or you're going to destroy yourselves you're going to destroy your planet of course it's their planet too because they live here okay mm-hmm. but they're coming around with that same old uh, disinformation campaign it's just you know it's, it's changed slightly it's basically we're from somewhere far away you can't get to where we are but we're here for your own good and you know you see this with the ancient alien uh, concept, which is we created you. Yeah, you know, yeah, we you, you're our property. You belong to us. You know these types of things, and this is a very insidious form of of, of mind control. It, it's designed to convince human beings that you are not autonomous, that you are not uh, your own master, you are not in control of yourself and your own destiny. You know, and people should be very very careful about anybody, anybody, human, non human. Uh, religious leader, political leader, or so-called alien that comes and tells you that they know what's best for you, that, that don't think for yourself, just do just do what you're told. And I think that's where a lot of this UFO uh, encounter stuff is leading, and I think that's where a lot of the uh, ancient alien stuff is, is eventually going to end up. Yeah, man, I like what you're saying there. And the themes of the ancient aliens idea and also modern alien encounters jive so well with religion as a control system, too. It's like we swapped out the spiritual lens for a scientific one, but the same story with God. He lives somewhere you can't reach. He knows what's best for you. He has a plan. He made the rules that you need to follow. And he, and he made you. He created you. Exactly, yeah. He's in charge of your destiny. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's exactly the same. Well, what if some of these underground beings are responsible for creating the three major religions? Well, think about this, too. I mean, people are easily manipulated even if they mean well, even if they are knowledgeable, even if they're putting genuine evidence together in a seemingly real picture, you know, solving a puzzle. But what if all this stuff's being fed to them intentionally in some way? Yeah, man, I love it. I'm starting to think it's all fed to us by some non-human source, and it's usually framed as archons or 
demons or Anunnaki, but this idea that it comes from an intelligence that lives in the shadows and beneath the surface with a few topside agents, you know, oh, maybe that's why they steal babies to raise them as their own and put them in power positions on the surface and then work through the bloodlines for as long as they can. But it seems totally feasible to me. And I also wanted to ask you, now I know you aren't really a Hollow Earth guy, but when it comes to the composition of the planet, do you think there's any major variation from the conventional model? If they manipulate us in so many ways, you'd think they'd have lies for that too. Well, you know, it's an interesting question. And I do, in all fairness, because the book is largely about subterranean mysteries, I, I do talk about the Hollow Earth in one chapter to some extent, you know, most of that whole chapter. But we have no way of knowing what the inner configuration is because we've never been there. We can guess, we can estimate, we can do tests and hypotheses and see if the test results match the hypotheses. We can interpret data that we gather. But ultimately, if, for instance, we had a protostar or a quasar that was stable or some other strange form at the center of the planet that was extremely dense and was had a specific charge and spin, then we might just assume it was a, a nickel iron core. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. We, we have no way of knowing this. Uh, it's all guesswork, you know. It is. It's just kind of like one of my favorite stories is about a guy named, named Wegener. And Wegener, Alfred Wegener, he, he proposed a theory back during the early part of the 20th century about something he called continental drift. And he looked at the shape of the continents and he said, well, these continents once all fit together as a puzzle just like puzzle pieces, and they slowly drifted apart. Well, he came up with this theory, and he was destroyed. He lost his credibility. He lost his academic standing, you know, so forth and so on. Well, now, you know, you, you fast forward several decades, and somebody else comes around along and says, oh, guess what? All these planets, I mean, all these continents used to fit together when the planet was young, and we had a great continent. It was called Pangaea. Well, that's what, that's what Wegener was saying. Mm -hmm. Then another guy comes forward and says, oh, guess what? We, we're floating around on these plates, and they're pulling the continents apart. We call this plate tectonics. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so there's Wegener's theory, except now it's accepted. And you see the same kind of thing happen with a lot of, a lot of anomalous things that people scoff at. You know, who knows what the future will hold for Hollow Earth theory? We don't know. Um, you know, I don't personally subscribe to it one way or the other. Yeah. I have to say I'm ag agnostic about it. Yeah. So I think that the planet itself demonstrably is much more complex than, than we are led to believe. You know, the, the, the crust of the earth is highly complex. It's, it's filled with gaps and voids and holes and tunnels and cavern systems and all this stuff. And even, as you know from my book, you know, at the, at the crust mantle boundary, there's a worldwide anomalous region called the Moho Rovisic discontinuity or the Moho for short, and the Moho is worldwide. It exists. It is real. And the U.S. Navy has tried to drill to it. The Russians have tried to reach it. Nobody has succeeded in reaching it. But we find that there's this largely vacuous area, very deep, at high pressure, and it shows up in you know in seismology and seismic readings as uh, valleys and troughs and mountains and things like this. So, is it full of water? Is it full of liquid fire? Is it full of air? You know, we have no way of knowing. Is there are there oceans in there that are being evaporated by heat, and then that's in turn resulting in the never-ending, continuous supply of fresh oxygen that is blowing out of large cave systems around the world. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting too, because I've been near a few caves, and you feel that air coming out, and you're like, "Yeah, where is that coming from?" Right. Where's it coming from? And you know, whether it's Lechuguilla Cave, you know, in in uh, in New Mexico, or or Blowing Cave in Arkansas, or Mammoth Cave, or the huge cave that's over in Vietnam. You know, these caves are constantly blowing fresh oxygenated air, constantly. Mm -hmm. And so, it's there's got to be a source for that. It's not just being generated down, you know, by the by the solid nickel iron core. Okay, so there has to be an inner area where that oxygen exists or where hydrogen H2O actually is probably being broken down um, into hydrogen and oxygen and expelled. And that would be something that would happen if there were internal internal oceans, which now we know all the time we hear news about another internal ocean being found in the crust somewhere. Yep. And if these bodies of water are being converted into oxygen by heat, that would explain 
uh, you know, that, that air pressure. Yeah. And I'm kind of with you on the hollow earth. I love the idea of it, but it's some of the, the theories of its composition are so radically different than what we know. It's hard to wrap my head around the idea of an inner sun or something. But when you bring up this moho layer between the crust and the mantle, that is really all I need. Cause in terms of surface area, it's the same, you know, it, it could be as just as vast with continents and oceans and all kinds of stuff right beneath our surface. And it doesn't really matter to me if it's looking inward or outward, because that's really the difference we're talking about with a with a hollow earth theory. It's just that they're they'd be pointed inward towards the inner sun. But if there's a layer like an Oreo, uh, like a layer of cream in between our crust and mantle, yeah. that's just as much surface area. There could be plenty of continents there. The whole Shangri-La thing could be there. Yeah. A um, lot of possibilities. Well, right on. Mike, this has been a fascinating show. I love that book. I hope we can do it again because there's so much more stuff we didn't even touch on. But uh, before I let you go, would you like to tell the people about some of your other work and website and anything else you got going on? Sure. You know, I've got, uh, I just say go to gravedistractions.com. That's my my publisher, gravedistractions.com. And there you can find all but one of my books. Um, you can find uh, Caverns, Cauldrons, and Concealed Creatures, the third edition. Please get the third edition. It is much more expansive, has a lot more material in it, and it will cost you less. And the others are out of print, or they are supposed to be out of print. And uh, so, yeah, get the third edition. You can get the third edition of Caverns, Cauldrons, and Concealed Creatures at Amazon or Barnes, Barnes & Noble. You can also get This Tragic Earth. You can get the, both of these books in Kindle, Nook, or print. Okay, and all the other uh, digital formats too. I also have a couple of uh, fantasy novels which deal with some of these themes. They're together in one volume. It's called the Pulsifer Saga, the Pulsifer Saga, and it's really, really uh, enjoyable stuff. People tell me it's also at Amazon and it is also at GraveDistractions.com. I recommend going through Grave Distractions to to, to click on the links for these books because. Um, that way you'll be sure and get the latest and greatest edition. The, the Pulse for Saga is now in the third illustrated edition, and that's the one that you want to get. And, uh, again, it's a better deal, too. So, And, of course, I have uh, This Tragic Earth, uh, Richard, the, the Art and World of Richard Sharp Shaver, and um, another book called Pulp Winds, which is a bunch of short fiction that's been published in different magazines and, and, and web magazines and things like that. And it finally got collected together into a, an interesting collection of sort of uh, adventure fiction, horror fiction, that kind of stuff, with some of these same th- themes present in it. And uh, I guess the other one would be uh, The Problem of Density in Regard to Non-Human Encounters, and that can only be found on Amazon, and that's not through gra- uh, Grave Distractions. And that, that's published by Interlight Communications. So that's it. Uh, go gravedistractions.com and look for my name under authors. And you'll find it. Cool. Very awesome, man. Well, can't thank you enough. So glad Dean Dominic DeLucia pushed me to get in touch with you. It has been a real blast. Uh, until next time, keep doing what you're doing, man, and take care of yourself out there, all right? Thank you, Greg. You too. I appreciate it. My God, people. I just love that episode. I think it 